Uh, it is so great uh, for you all to be able to join us this afternoon. Uh, thanks so much to Myth and Adhume uh, for helping us put on this event this afternoon. Uh, we are excited to introduce uh, Joey Takeda, who will be presenting his digital dialogue, Sustaining DH, Endings, Dependencies, and Infrastructure. And before we begin this afternoon, uh, we will have our colleague, Raph Viglianti, give a brief introduction. Hi everyone, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Joy Takeda, uh, who's a developer um, in the Digital Humanities Innovation Lab at Simon Fraser University Library. Uh, he holds an MA in English Literature from the University of British Columbia, a BA in English and Gender Studies from the University of Victoria, and is currently completing a Master's of Library in Information Science at the University of Alberta. Um, he's an elected member of the Text Encoding Initiative TEI Council. Um, it's also part of the TEI by example International Advisory Committee and the Public Knowledge Project Technical Advisory Committee and has worked on a variety of DH projects and initiatives including the Map of Early Modern London, the Winifred Eden Archive and the en Endings Projects uh, which I'm sure we'll be hearing about um, in this talk. His current research centers on text encoding, digital critical editing and sustainable infrastructures for DH development uh, in academic libraries. Uh, his talk, this digital dialogue talk today is titled Sustaining the H Endings, Dependencies, Infrastructure. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us and welcome, John. Thank you and thank you uh, all for having me here. Thanks. Um, uh, thank you all for coming, both people here in College Park um, and out there, wherever you may be. Uh, for joining me today to talk a bit about sustainability uh, within the digital humanities. Um, and I just want to extend my gratitude again to MIT um, and all the organizers for inviting me here uh, to come and talk as part of this series. Um, before I begin, uh, I just want to acknowledge that uh, much of the work um, that I did on endings and then also the work that I do uh, now uh, takes place on unceded slave to Coquitlam, Squamish, and Musqueam territory. Uh, and uh, also acknowledge the ancestral territories of the Piscataway uh, people on which uh, we currently stand. Um, and uh, the website from which these maps come from is nativeland.ca and I encourage you to take a look um, to, see, um, to see the territories on which you uh, occupy. Um, so, um, as, uh, as uh, you heard in the introduction, um, I currently work as a uh, developer at Simon Fraser University's Digital Humanities Innovation Lab. This is our logo. It doesn't say <laughs> SFU on it, but I still love it. It's my favorite version of the logo that we have. Um, it's a small unit housed within the university library uh, that started up around 2017. Uh, and the DHL supports a wide range of DH projects that vary in size and scope. Um, and I've been with the DHL since 2020. Um, sorry, let me just, um, DHL since 2020, uh, and as you can guess, given the timing, I started in 2020, so I really didn't see the campus until about 2021. Um, but before that, I worked uh, within the Humanities Computing and Media Center at the University of Victoria, um, is where I also did my undergrad. Um, and I worked at that lab at the HCMC uh, in a variety of roles from research assistant to junior programmer. Uh, and then as a consultant programmer for a number of projects, um, including the Endings Project. Um, and my talk is going to, uh, today I'm going to talk a bit about my own sort of reflections on the Endings Project and the Endings Principles, um, but it's as much of the sort of discussion of the principles as it is sort of a reading of them and some of the assumptions and questions that are contained in them, and then also my kind of experience of working on that project. Um, and I do want to talk uh, in more detail about the Endings Project, um, this is its homepage, um, uh, and about sort of what we are talking about when we talk about building sustainable uh, digital humanities projects. Uh, but before doing that, I want to preface my discussion um, with a bit of a reflection on that term sustainable or sustainability. Um, and of course, sustainability is a weighty term. It's, it's charged with all sorts of technical, ecological, infrastructural, architectural, economic meaning. Um, and really which I can't do kind of full justice to here today. Um, but I do want to think about what it offers those engaged in the work of uh, fortifying DH projects, um, as well as sort of 
how sustainability can allow us to sort of fight against um, what Matthew Kirschenbaum calls the perceived uh, fragility of uh, the digital and consequently of the age. Um, I'm, I'm, and I'm inspired here in thinking about sustainability and in particular that term to sustain um, from Amy Earhart's uh, Traces of the Old Uses of the New um, from 2015, um, which is a careful sort of tracing of, of the kind of the history of digital literary scholarship. Uh, and in Earhart's discussion of the demise of many early digital recovery projects and digital edition projects, she notes that digital humanists are fond of talking about sustainability as a problem for current and future works, but it's clear that we already have sustained a good deal of loss within the broadly defined digital humanities canon. And here she's speaking about all these projects from the late 1990s and early 2000s, which sort of emerged and then are no longer findable um, or maybe have some sort of trace on the Wayback Machine, um, but their original forms can't really be found anymore. Um, and I'm, I really like this quotation, in particular because of the use of sustain here. There's sort of a doubleness um, being, being sort of represented by the word to, to sustain. Um, at once it represents this sort of custodial act of caring for, or tending to, or maintaining um, that sort of first definition of sustain, to support, maintain, uphold. Um, but it also, in talking about the, uh, the great deal of loss that DH had sustained, um, also refers to the second definition from the OED, which is to endure something painful, difficult, or unpleasant without failing or giving way to bear or withstand. Um, where sustained sort of here means like some inflicted damage, a nagging burden that erodes and kind of paradoxically can create rather than mitigate breakdown. Uh, and in many ways, that's what an upkeep of a project means to an institution or how an institution might see maintenance or maintaining or sustaining a project. Uh, sustaining a project to keep it going, to maintain it, even though the technical stack is crumbling and developers are grafting on hack after hack to keep it alive, um, is frequently injurious to the broader institutional body. Uh, the, the institution sometimes sustains a project like it sustains an injury. Right? Uh, and it's that second sense of sustain that in many ways served as the impetus for the Endings Project. Um, as Martin Holmes and I detail in our article uh, for Digital Humanities Quarterly about the Endings Principles, um, the HCMC, um, which has been around since uh, the 90s, uh, was faced with a significant maintenance burden, um, one that threatened to uh, overwhelm the lab's ability to support new projects coming through the door. Um, so that is where the Endings Project kind of came from, this need um, and the sort of inability to kind of keep up with all the maintenance, but also allow new projects to come in while trying to maintain this stack of old projects. Um, so collectively, the Endings Project aimed to create um, a set of principles that outlined how projects could be built, either retrospectively or from the outset, in ways that can ensure maximal archivability and durability. Um, and it was a collaborative research initiative from the University of Victoria, um, funded by, by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council, uh, and brought together uh, faculty PIs, um, Claire Carlin, Janelle Jenstad, Eva uh, Tchaikovsky Higgins, Elizabeth Grove White, uh, librarians, um, John Durno, Lisa Goddard, and Matt Huckalack, and developers, Martin Holmes, Stuart O'Neill, and Greg Newton, all of whom I listed all their names here because I also want to acknowledge um, their work in the Ending Project and all of the sort of, um, many of the materials I draw from here are, are from uh, their work or are inspired by some of their sort of infinite wisdom. And what we decided uh, in harmony with both sort of what the industry was doing, um, sort of towards the jam stack, uh, and what NDH was um, moving towards minimal computing, um, we decided that static websites were really the thing that were archivable. Um, and these are uh, websites that require no on-the-fly server processing, so no, um, no requirement to have a server running or any sort of interaction with that server. Uh, ones that are just HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Uh, and here's a little diagram. Um, apologies that the things at the bottom are hard to read. Um, but this is just sort of a diagram of how a static site works of 
you have your source files, usually they're processed in some way, they create HTML pages, uh, you put them on your server, your browser requests them, the server sends them, the person sees them. Um, and the reason that we wanted to do static websites, or the reason why we kind of looked at static websites is due in part to their long-term durability. Um, so once they're deployed, they don't really require maintenance. Um, and unlike server-side applications, there's no risk of incompatible upgrades that either break the application or force the site to be remade or remediated or retired um, or, or even put it at risk to as um, many server-side sort of applications are. If they're lingering on a server for too long, there might be one day where they just get, the lights get turned out uh, because they don't want to, some system administration or something like that has sort of deemed that the vulnerability of this application is too much to bear. And static sites, as we conceive them at least, have the benefit of being comprised of technologies that are all web standards, which we feel confident um, will persist. Uh, and given the sort of history of HTML's kind of rigorous backwards compatibility, um, it's hard to imagine a world in which HTML stops working um, of course, anything could happen. Um, and static sites are uh, portable. Um, they can run on any server, and they can they can be replicable. So they can be replicated on every kind of server. You can have many copies of the static site, and they just would exist and function all in the exact same way, um, which makes them very desirable for being able to replicate in different libraries or have an archive and have them placed in multiple archives. Um, a classic example of this is that the first website uh, is a static website. Um, so this is Tim Berners-Lee, uh, sort of intro to the World Wide Web. It is really fascinating to look at. It's a great website to just go explore. Um, it promises that everything about the WWW is there. Um, there's a few links. Um, it's, it's really great. Um, but my kind of favorite example of a long-running static site uh, is an arguably equally important cultural artifact, uh, which is Space Jam website. Um, that still works. It's from 1996, 1997, um, and it was created to promote the film. And it's been sort of talked about quite a lot as a sort of a nostalgia-laden example of early web design. Um, and while I'm kind of joking about it, it is really interesting. I've, I mean, I spent much longer than I anticipated going down rabbit hole after rabbit hole reading about the Space Jam website. Um, I had a thought at one point, it's like, is this whole presentation just going to be about Space Jam? <laughs> um, so, and this is a static site and it still works perfectly well. You can go to any of the links um, and, and explore, and explore the Space Jam universe. Um, so, Unlike in the development world, though, of Jamstack or minimal computing, where static sites are sort of what are built from the very beginning, right? People are often thinking about how am I going to build an infrastructure? How am I going to build a website from the start? I'm going to make a static one. Uh, the Endings Project wasn't focused on how to construct things from the beginning. The main focus um, and the initial task was on converting four long-running projects into something that could at any point be archived. Um, and our initial experiments um, with the Wayback Machine were unsuccessful. So we thought maybe the Wayback Machine might be a way to have these sort of archived websites. Um, but the use of the Wayback Machine, we investigated, we looked at some of the old websites. Um, and many of the projects failed to be archived fully, as many of the pages on the websites were produced on the fly via query strings. So they had some sort of, rather than the pages being actual pages, the pages never really existed. They sort of were constructed and produced at the request. Um, because there was no real request coming in, um, the, the crawler wasn't able to archive that page. Uh, and in the sort of um, research for this, um, and down one of these sort of Space Jam rabbit holes, uh, I realized that the Space Jam website hasn't always been static, um, contrary to some of uh, other people's claims, like Eric Malinowski, who writes an, an excellent article in the Rolling Stones about, about, uh, about the Space Jam website. Um, the original website is on the Wayback Machine, um, or at least the homepage is. 
But if you try to go to any of the planets or the spaceship, uh, it doesn't work. And in part, it's because you can see that there's a query string there. And this may also be because of 1997 image map um, uh, sort of construction. Um, but we can see that this, is, this was a barrier for the, the crawler to be able to archive that page. In 2000, however, um, it seems like, uh, sort of like Michael Jordan in the film being pulled out of retirement, uh, the site was resurrected, um, and, but this time it was a static website. Um, so these pages now all work. Here is one of the sort of um, behind the jam page, um, which includes a lot of really interesting images and production skill, uh, stills. Um, and then throughout the aughts, and you can kind of see this in the little top bar there, um, there's sort of this period where there's nothing being archived. Um, throughout the aughts, they, Warner Brothers or whatever the film studio was, decided to kind of change management, change their web infrastructure, uh, and no longer supported the website. It went down um, until it kind of resurged in popularity in the 2010s. Um, and so now, but since the early 2000s, at least this one, the one from the 2000s, is static and archived completely properly on the Wayback Machine. Um, and we can see that this is a static site just because it has a sort of singular page, or we can presume at least that it's a static site because it has a single page. Um, it's a little bit misleading. These are all kind of frames, so these are all pages within a page, but I think the point still holds that this is a static page um, that had a kind of simple um, sort of construction. And so what we can kind of learn from this parable of Space Jam is not only that the Wayback Machine is an imperfect archiving strategy, it's a good one, but it's not perfect, uh, and uh, that static sites lend themselves to being crawled, um, but also that there is value in the preservation of all components of the website. So there's many strategies for archiving various pieces of a website. The data you can put in the data repository, the code, um, some of that will be automatically archived on GitHub. You can put it on Zenodo and get a DOI. Um, but encapsulating and archiving the entire website is much more difficult, but also I think really critical. Um, the websites, it's, uh, the website, the project, the interface, its interactions um, are really inextricable from the data, uh, and they render not only a kind of key component of the project's intellectual content uh, and its place within institutional and disciplinary histories. Um, uh, and this is sort of what Claire Warwick uh, also says in uh, their 2020 article in Digital Scholarship in the Humanities. Um, but it also represents a significant amount of often collaborative labor that may already be unnoticed or uncredited. So that there's an interface design, that somebody designed this, that there's a work of uh, creating the structure and the architecture of this website. All of that gets lost if the entire thing isn't preserved. Um, So this is what Endings kind of tried to solve with the Endings principles, thinking about the entirety of the website. Uh, and so the uh, Endings project came up with a set of five principles that went through some revisions as the project was kind of working through how to statisize these uh, sort of initial projects, um, but more or less kind of stayed consistent um, in these kind of major groupings. Um, there's data, so the ending principles for data include things like data in standardized formats um, and under version control. Uh, documentation, um, documentation um, meaning all sorts of documentation, documentation in your code, documentation uh, about your project practices, um, documentation about things like licensing, reuse, um, all of these things are really important. Um, in the DHQ special issue, uh, James Cummings has an article called Academics Retire and Servers Die. Um, and it's about, um, I won't spoil it, but uh, it's about the, uh, uh, about the problems that happen when you have a long-running project 
um, but you can't even get the files off somebody's computer, and no one knows who owns what stuff. I um, mean, that's where documentation is really important, more than just for posterity or more than just to sort of have um, um, a good record of what you've done, but also just a paper trail. Um, uh, we also talk about um, processing. And processing is that stage of generating your website. Um, processing, the principles for processing um, are interesting because they acknowledge that processing code is always going to be contingent um, and likely ephemeral. There's very little chance that any of the code we write is going to be as sustainable as the website that we build. That is what we're kind of trying to, it's okay for the code not to be able to work anymore in 10 years, but we want the website to still work in 10 years. Um, or maybe it's an unreasonable restriction for that code to, to work in 10 years. Um, and the principles are all documented on uh, endings.ubic.ca slash principles. Um, and uh, uh, I, I have slides that go through each one of them, but they're in an appendix now at the end. Um, but we can, if you have any questions about them, we can always go and look at the, uh, the sort of point by point principles. Um, the main kind of bulk of the endings principles are really about the products. Um, and the products, uh, the principles for products include things like no dependence on uh, servers, um, no, de no external dependencies at all. Um, I think it's phrased no, uh, no jQuery, uh, no, um, I think it says Angular, but no Angular, no React, no jQuery, um, no dependency on any external thing. Um, especially for uh, your JavaScript, which should be, um, should gracefully fail. So all of your HTML and your CSS should be the thing that works for your site and all functionality should work without JavaScript enabled. Um, it's not because JavaScript won't necessarily work, but it's that, or that people might have it turned off, but that JavaScript can have all sorts of other things that are getting, that cause vulnerabilities but then also that the JavaScript itself may not work in all environments. Browsers may change policies. Um, and that is sort of um, one of the reasons why the site should be progressively enhanced so that uh, any work, uh, anything that the site does, it can work without JavaScript, at least reasonably well. Uh, and then the final principle is about release management. And this is um, with respect to the sort of rallying against what's called like the rolling release model. So not wanting um, people to be able, able to edit individual pages and those pages get out of sync, right? Because um, one of the challenges that we had in the endings project is even defining what was a singular page or what was a singular website because pages are interlinked. An update to one piece of data, you have uh, a database or a personography. You update one person and that change propagates across the website. And what we found in the server side or the server backed applications is that somebody would change an unrelated page, a, a person's page or something, and some other page all the way over here broke. We didn't know why and how those two things were connected um, when somebody was just updating an individual page. And then that created, made cascading failure across the website. Um, with the static websites, all of our processing is done continuously. So every time somebody makes a change, to uh, a file or a document, the whole website rebuilds and the whole website is refreshed. So an individual project or an individual website is one sort of coherent uh, and co uh, consistent and complete artifact. Um, so this release model uh, is really sort of predicated on the understanding of like the book and of the addition model. It is like, as if you have additions of a website. Um, and alongside the principles, which, um, like I said, Martin and I talk about in our article, um, there's also endings compliance. And I think endings compliance is something we don't, uh, at least within the endings uh, group, we refer to quite a lot of websites being endings compliant. Uh, but we don't talk about the, um, what that really means and what that really, uh, what are those sort of rules around it. Um, and we do have on, our, on the endings website a uh, sort of page about compliance. Uh, and it gives a kind of like a great summary TLDR of the principles, which is that all code has been thoroughly validated. 
So your source code, uh, if you're working in XML, then that's been validated. Whatever your data structure is, your source data files, um, those have been validated. All of your JavaScript, CSS, any other file, also valid against whatever kind of standard um, you're wanting it to be valid against. Uh, and your HTML is valid against the W3C's validator um, to make sure that everything is correct. We want to make sure that the entire site is correct. And that all, all internal links have been tested and targets confirmed to exist. I mean, these are internal links, so not links out to other people because who knows, right? Those, we, we're not in control of what other people are doing and what, what their websites are, whether those website links are going to work. But you can control whether your internal links are working uh, and you know, that you don't have any typos when you're saying you're going from one page to another page. Um, all internal links are relative so that the site can be hosted anywhere. So that um, rather than saying having your fully qualified domain name, you just have going up a step or down a step. Or ideally, um, in one of the recommendations and the admins principles is to have a flat website. So not to have subfolders and other and, and, and sort of nested structure that the website itself should be completely flat um, to sort of mitigate any weird past things of having to go all the way up or all the way back down or find a, where that CSS file or if something moves all of a sudden, then the website breaks. Um, it's to avoid that kind of problem. So a flat website with relative links um, so the site can be hosted anywhere. Um, and the, uh, I noticed in the Space Jam, sorry to bring it back to Space Jam, uh, that website doesn't uh, use relative links. So in my presentation, you can actually play around with the website, but I didn't do that because as soon as you click one of the things, it takes you actually to the Space Jam website. It doesn't just work internally. Um, friendly compliance, no server-side scripting, so no PHP, no Python. Um, none of that should be required. No backend database software. Um, Every page on the site carries the same clear edition and date information. Um, and this is part of what the ending project didn't necessarily have as a goal, but had as a really um, a sort of an impetus, a sort of, a, a sort of um, ethos that sort of drove the project, which was about the scholarly nature of these digital projects. If a project can be preserved, if it can be archived, um, it helps with that legitimacy of digital scholarship. It ensures that these things stay around and can be cited and people um, aren't worried about citing um, a digital project. Uh, and for any compliance, having that clear edition and date uh, on a page signals not only that this is a coherent singular entity that all comes from edition three or 3.1, um, but also makes them easier to cite. Um, and allows students or researchers to cite this page easily and refer back to it. Uh, and the last one for any compliance is that there are no external dependencies. Um, and, but if there are, then they are peripheral to the main functionality and when they fail, the results will not be significant. And that last one, the external dependencies, is where we get more of the hangups. Uh, whenever we, um, in talking with other developers, um, I think the idea of the ending principles are often quite, um, quite reasonable. And then the lack of, of, the inability to have dependencies starts to feel a little bit odd, I think, for people. Because we're used to, especially in sort of development, working with stuff that other people have already done. Why reinvent the wheel? Why not create, like, why not rely on other people to create, um, to create what you're wanting to make? Um, and this is um, an example of how dependencies sort of fail. This is the newest Space Jam website. Um, last one, I promise. Um, and this is uh, from their 2024 website. They had, uh, they have a sequel that I guess has come out already. Um, but their website, their current website does not work on the Internet Archive. So 2000's website, yes. Um, but their new one does not because it loads up into 100% and then there's supposed to be like a YouTube modal 
and that just doesn't work on the Internet Archive. And we can see on the sort of dev console that something's going on in the JavaScript there, some dependency um, doesn't work in that environment. This is part of the reason why for the endings principles we say that the JavaScript should be um, a progressive enhancement or graceful failure, that this shouldn't be the case where JavaScript doesn't work properly, um, then the site doesn't work properly. Um, so as I was saying, the end, uh, external dependencies tend to be the sort of sticking point for a lot of people. Um, and I think dependencies are a really interesting thing to think with um, and about what, what it means to actually have these external dependencies in a project. Um, so external dependencies um, are resources that promise to stay around or continue working. So these are things that we rely on and we hope that will continue to work when we're building our websites. So this could be things like a search server or map tiles or something as simple as a JavaScript library to help you do something. Um, pad a number left um, by a few zeros, for instance. Um, and these digital dependencies are liable to disappear, break down, change the terms, etc. cetera. Um, there's many instances of this, the left pad, um, sort of as I was referring to a second ago, um, a library that was published uh, on um, NPM that uh, basically um, I think had a uh, sort of hack built into the left pad library and then basically caused uh, many, many websites to fail, including something like Facebook. And this was just a small utility library that added some zeros to the left of a number. And this is a dependency that big organizations like Facebook didn't even know that they really had because dependencies were being chained all the way, all the way down. Um, can't be a presentation without an XKCD uh, comic. Um, so this is one uh, talking about digital infrastructure and how digital infrastructure currently operates. So all mm -hmm. modern digital infrastructure uh, and then the tiny sliver of a pillar uh, a project some random person in Nebraska has been thankfully maintaining since 2003. Um, and I think for these dependencies and to understand uh, and to like, think about them um, is to also recognize that it's sort of a fantasy that will never be away from dependencies. Um, it's, a, it's a fiction, right? Because they, that can never be accomplished. Um, there's always going to be dependencies sort of all the way down, depending on how we understand uh, what it means to be dependent on something and on one another. Um, here's another example of a bad dependency. Uh, Google Maps, I think you probably, you might have seen something like this when Google Maps changed their terms uh, in, I think, a couple years ago. Um, all Google Maps just started to break. Um, so yeah, so all, so some dependencies are just unavoidable. So some complex functionality, for instance, um, established standards, so functionality or user expectations you might qualify those as a dependency, even though they're not necessarily a technical dependency in the same way. It's still something that we depend on. Uh, and others, we depend on others all the time, and that's sort of the spirit of DH in many ways, right? DH has been championed as a sort of collaborative enterprise, um, and that requires depending on other people. Um, this is from uh, Stephanie Dick and Daniel Volmar's um, DLL Hell, which catalogs sort of this uh, really uh, compelling history of um, the Windows um, dynamic link libraries um, uh, dependency uh, and how uh, early, um, early uh, computer engineers uh, and the early kind of Windows computing um, community dealt with the sort of software dependency, the failure, and the maintenance that goes around them. Uh, and they say that even the simplest applications must attach to complex chains of interdependent software packages, which cut across multiple lines of ownership, origin, and organizational authority, an unruly conglomeration that tends to invite misunderstanding and subtly mistaken assumptions. Um, and there are, all, there are all sorts of vectors um, and, and sort of intersections when it comes to thinking about our dependencies and all the various sort of ramifications of not only when we depend on something, but also when projects depend on um, 
on various like, infra uh, institutional structures and infrastructures. Um, so this is something that uh, I've often said when talking about endings uh, that hell is other f servers, um, quoting pretty much hell is other people. Um, but in thinking more about the way in which we are dependent on far more than just the kind of technical infrastructures or these technical infrastructures or socio-technical infrastructures, um, I've been thinking more about how those dependencies uh, Require, some, require that kind of level of complexity, that kind of thinking about what it means to be in relationship to one another. Um, so uh, Lauren Berlant very recently uh, has taken up the hell of other people uh, and amended it to say, hell of other people, if you're lucky. Um, and that's in their recent on the inconvenience uh, of other people. Uh, and they write, though, uh, they write that mostly other people are not hell. Mostly the sense of friction they produce is not directed towards a specific looming threat. Mostly people are inconvenient. An inconvenience for Belant refers to the effective sense of the familiar friction of being in relation. Um, so all of this is not to say that we actually need to take on dependencies or that uh, accruing technical debt is a good idea, at least theoretically, uh, but rather to kind of account for the kinds of collaboration and the irritation and the pressures of inconvenience that are enacted in that collaboration. Um, and so mu much of what endings is attempting to alleviate and have attempted to alleviate in the broadest sense is the inconvenience and the burden that is sustained by systems administrators and technical experts. Um, so of course what happens when you're having to maintain software is that that work is then pushed on to systems administrators or technical staff or um, research software engineers. Uh, and that kind of creates that sort of hell, that dependency hell, that hell of having to maintain the maintenance burden. Uh, and in doing so, that kind of relegation of maintenance of this mundane, banal, um, aggravating, irritating um, practice converts these sort of technical staff into kind of mechanics, right? Tasked to these never-ending cycle of updates and tweaks, et cetera. But on the other hand, and this is where I kind of want to uh, sort of hone in, is that the conditions of labor are such that we may be able to think about the energizing capacities of something like staticizing, that the labor kind of cuts both ways. So this act of sustainability can be something that is energizing. Um, and I think it's worth mentioning that I hadn't really been involved in any of these projects when we were talking about the Endings Project. When I joined the Endings Project, I'd worked for the Map of Early Modern London, um, but otherwise the other three sort of core projects were not ones that I had really any experience with. They were all in the lab, um, but I didn't really know how they worked uh, technically. Um, and at that point, I didn't know how to code. I didn't know how to do any of the sort of development work. Um, but the process of staticizing is how I learned to code, to do this sort of work, that the trying to replicate a site exactly is a, you know, the common sort of uh, technical sort of challenge, or if you see this in like coding boot camps, and staticizing and the sort of work of maintenance was a, was a challenging and interesting pedagogical sort of moment. Um, and part of what the practice of uh, sort of um, endings and maintenance um, allows is the sort of challenge of how do we turn this site into a static site? What can we do? How can we take this dynamic functionality that we think is only possible on a server, and how can we replicate that? Um, what are, or what are some ways in which we might not actually need that feature, or how can we improve on that feature in a way that still bears true to the original sort of idea um, of, of the project, but also improves upon it, or, or you know, changes it infrastructurally. Um, and I think that it, it's a challenge of thinking minimally, um, but also expansively, of working ways that move beyond pure maintenance, um, but also sort of with and against innovation. So it allows us to sort of think about this sort of careful acts of repair and care uh, and tending to websites um, beyond just pure sort of maintenance burden and maintenance help. 
we can think about statisizing as a, as a creative intellectual act and one that um, is more than just sort of mere sort of labor or mere sort of um, updates and, uh, and, and maintenance. Um, and this sort of thinking about the broad sort of uh, effective capacities of, of endings and of, of sustainability um, is brought uh, is brought to the uh, to the fore for, uh, by um, Claire Battersell in the DHQ special issue for endings, uh, and she says. And she says, the value in thinking about the stories and relationships we are making along with the websites, digital archives, databases, tools, marked up texts, maps, and innumerable other uh, digital artifacts that arise from large scale collabor collaborations in this field. And we need to think beyond institutional repositories and mirror sites to consider the lived experience of project making and the structure of the stories we tell about digital work. And I think thinking about the stories we tell, the broad sort of ways in which sustainability is more than just a sort of transaction between a project and an archive or a project and a sort of systems administrator, uh, but thinking about the act of sustaining, statisizing, um, and archiving website as a, as a critical sort of moment in which we can um, really uh, sort of invest um, sort of intellectual and uh, and creative sort of um, judgment. So um, I think I have time still, right? Um, I wanted to just go through two kind of projects in which um, that were outside of the endings remit um, or weren't kind of the core projects, but ones that I think kind of help flesh out the sort of concept of sustainability and of these sort of labor practices that go beyond um, just maintenance. Um, the first one that I want to talk about is uh, Landscapes of Injustice Project. Uh, and this is a project that I joined um, sort of later in its development. Um, and the Landscapes of Injustice Project was a large shirk funded project um, led by Jordan Stinger Ross at the University of Victoria. And it dealt with uh, Japanese Canadian displacement uh, and internment. Um, so in the 1940s, uh, during the Second World War, Japanese Canadians were um, basically displaced from their homes, their, possess their possessions taken and, and shipped off more or less to other places in Canada, so Alberta, uh, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, etc. cetera. Um, and the Landscapes and Justice Project was trying to take all of this documentary evidence that had existed in the Canadian archives, because um, as we often see, right, these acts of uh, of juridical violence are very well documented, right? There, there are scores of documents um, in, in the archive about Japanese Canadian displacement. Um, and in working on this project, uh, I came to it, and there were about five or six different project groups that were all doing different sorts of things, um, very much enacting, um, I think, what minimal computing would kind of say is um, that sort of negotiation between what the project needs uh, and what's going to be kind of the easiest thing for right now, right? What's the kind of minimal kind of um, infrastructure that's needed in order to get the work done? Um, so some of the projects were doing things in spreadsheets, some of them were doing them in TEI, some of them were using databases, these small sort of silos, these kind of sub-projects within the project. Uh, and I was brought on to kind of bring together all of these projects, and this is during my time of working on the Endings Project, uh, and I was thinking about how to make these all of these things sustainable. We had databases of land titles. We had uh, a bunch of TI documents um, and all sorts of other, um, uh, other sort of bits of data. And one of the things um, that I found when I was doing this is, and we all kind of, we all kind of find um, when you're working on a project, you kind of usually take some record and that's going to be your record that you're going to use to test for everything. Um, I chose protest letter 001, uh, which is one of the protest letters being written um, against the uh, custodian uh, of the Canadian government, um, uh, advocating for the return of possession, return of, of land. Um, and in doing that, I discovered my great grandfather, who was the first one on the on the top, uh, who's here today, um, who was part of the South Fraser Farmers Union. Uh, 
and as I was working through this project and I started to learn, started to compile more of these documents, I started to be able to have more uh, of these sort of example documents, these case study documents to work with. Um, here's just a picture of, of, of the letter uh, that he was a signatory on. More documents about things like um, these are the uh, custodian case files. So every Japanese Canadian who was interned uh, or displaced had uh, a kind of a record about them, or uh, um, mostly men uh, over the age of, I want to say, 17, 18. Um, and this kind of gives this biography of his life, more or less. It gives relationships, uh, uh, children, where he lived, um, where he was uprooted to, etc. Um, and these are, were all contained in a big reel in the um, Library of the Archives Canada, and what the research assistants were doing were just going through and saying, here's where one record starts, here's where it ends, and then compiling some of that information. Um, that's just like the title card of this, and here's um, a sort of page of that uh, officer's custodian sort of uh, tabulating of, of, of possession uh, and, and sort of vital details. Um, and I want, wanted to bring this up and I wanted to talk about it because I think there's a sort of third element of sustaining. And I think um, alongside the sort of positive, effective thing of maintaining and supporting, um, and alongside the more negative sort of uh, effect of, of, of burden, but there's a third one, and I think it's to be sustained by, right? What the kind of work that we're doing, what sustains us as we do this work, right? This is a very big project. It was a difficult project to work on um, for technical, personal reasons, right? It's a, it's a big, it was a big kind of um, archive of information to, to work through. Um, and effectively challenging as well for, I mean, a lot of the team members were Japanese Canadians as well. Um, but I do think that work of statusizing or preserving and knowing that this is now going to be preserved, archived, and be in a place that is actually sustainable and be uh, constructed in such a way that it can be sustained is sustaining, personally sustaining. It kind of gives um, resonance to the, to the work um, that, that we do in DH um, as, as developers. I want to go into a second case study. Uh, here's another uh, sort of Asian American literature um, example. And this is the Wonderful Eaton Archive. Um, so the Wonderful Eaton Archive was launched in 2020, but its earliest manifestation was um, nearly 20 years earlier as Jimmy Cole's Wonderful Eaton Digital Archive. And if, you'd re uh, if you've read um, Amy Earhart's book that I mentioned earlier. This is one of the projects that Amy Earhart identifies as one of the digital archive as one of these early recovery projects, literary recovery projects that were lost, that were sort of gone um, and, and dismembered. Um, the Winifred Eaton Digital Archive was hosted by the University of Virginia's eTech Center, I think 98, something like that, um, in TEI P4. Um, and Earhart identifies the WEDA as sort of emblematic of the early history of digital literary recovery projects, um, noting that it serves as an example of both uh, successful recovery collaboration between institutional centers and individual scholars, and the now all too familiar history of half-hazard digital preservation. Uh, when the eTech Center was decommissioned in 2010, the standalone Winifred Eaton Digital Archive project was dismantled and Eaton's texts uh, without accompanying images or Gene Lee Cole's critical paratext were subsequently ingested into the UEA's uh, digital repositories of indi individual files. Um, this effectively dissolved the WEDA uh, and as Earhart notes, left Eaton's recovered body of work obscured once more. Um, and I guess I should have said, Winifred Eaton was the first uh, Asian American, um, Asian Canadian novelist uh, she was born in Montreal, 1875, I, I want to say, uh, uh, half Chinese, half British. Um, but she spent most of her career in the United States um, uh, publishing as uh, Anato Watana, 
so she, for the first about 10, 20 years of her, about first 15 years or so of her career, she spent pretending to be a Japanese American, uh, even though she was a Chinese Canadian. Um, she was the sister of Sui Sin Far, uh, or Edith Eaton, um, so she is the uh, sort of, <laughs> yeah, she is like the sort of the bad sister, that is sort of the, the classic sort of framing, Edith Eaton being the good sister, Winfred Eaton being the bad sister, who was sort of a sellout. Um, her work is really complicated and interesting, um, historically, uh, and, and there's tons of it. Winifred Eaton wrote a ton of stuff, not only as a sort of really popular Japanese, Japanese novelist, Japanese novelist, um, but also later in her career in Canada, she was quite uh, a popular sort of literary luminary, uh, and then she was also um, part of Universal and uh, MGM uh, as one of the earliest sort of uh, screenwriters uh, in, in Hollywood, um, working on things like The Phantom of the Opera uh, and Wolf of Wall Street and all sorts of other sort of major films. Um, so the Winifred Eaton Digital Archive started to kind of catalog this really sort of expansive career that Winifred Eaton had uh, uh, and kind of recovering her work. But in, uh, in like I said, it was then ingested into that Virgo, uh, into the Virgo catalog by UVA uh, and was only sort of imperfectly archived in the Internet Archive. Um, and Jean Lee Colwyn, she was reflecting on, on the WEDA at the launch of the Winfred Eaton Archive, uh, said that the WEDA became like so many digital recovery projects, quote, another ghost in the Wayback Machine, which I think is just a great line. Um, so when we remade the WEDA, we took these WEDA files um, and really tried to uh, retain all of their information, but also sort of expand it and kind of revive the WEDA in new form. Uh, and thinking about the relationship of the historical sort of, um, and here's a picture of the Winifred Eaton archive as it is now, uh, and a picture of what the WEDA looked like uh, as of 2008. Um, unfortunately, this page, you can get to the home page, but you can't actually see any of the text. Um, but as we were sort of working on the WEA, um, the, the disappearance and spectral afterlife of the WEA served for us not just as a parable of the challenges of creating sustainable infrastructures, but also a productive occasion for recognizing the collaborative and generative forms of labor involved in recovering, repairing, and rebuilding a digital archive. Um, so just as the work of literary recovery is um, sort of an ongoing process that entangles uh, practical, theoretical, and ideological concerns, um, the work of re-recovery is what we're sort of calling this work, the work of taking the Winifred Eaton Digital Archive and remaking it into the Winifred Eaton Archive is more than just an exercise of excavating uh, and rescuing digital artifacts. Um, we sort of understood it as an act of what uh, Stephen J. Jackson calls repair, um, so those subtle acts of care by which order and meaning in complex socio-technical systems are maintained and transformed. So just as kind of a way to sort of wrap up, um, I sort of want to emphasize, um, and this is from Janet uh, Abbott and Stephanie Dixon introduction to the recent abstractions and embodiments. Um, and they say that to think with computers is to think about social relationships, or social relations. Uh, and I want to emphasize that in staticizing, this work of taking a project and ending it, of making it static, of, of archiving it, doesn't necessarily mean a sort of severing of all relations, of all these social relations that it might have. Um, and that there are myriad forms of labor, networks, relationships, and care involved in recovery and staticizing and archiving and ending and re-recovering uh, and in collaborating across technological paradigms and challenges uh, and thinking about the affordances of the perceived fragility of digital projects. Um, and vital to sort of recognize and value these sort of moments in which there is technical breakdown, these moments that we might look at as sort of rote maintenance, 
but actually take them as opportunities to really rethink about the capacities of that uh, object and how it can be sustained in the long term. Um, and we can kind of take the degradation of the digital project uh, as a central and interesting problem with which to work rather than, at best, a sign of impending doom or at worst a justification not to do the work at all. Um, so I want to just reinforce the notion that even though the ending principles and ending compliance call for a lack of dependencies, it's useful to understand the variety of dependencies that go into the act of sustaining. Uh, and what I've hoped to outline here that the creation of ending compliance is about negotiating what, what dependencies matters, being clear about the purpose of them, and recognizing that, the various, that there are various kinds of labor that go into act of repair, that statusizing itself isn't just maintenance, but rather intellectual and creative, uh, an intellectual and creative act that is part of the work itself. Uh, and that dependencies and the management of dependencies and the production of sustainability is deeply ongoing and relational. Um, and so I sort of want to leave off with some sort of questions um, in, in the sort of tradition of minimal computing where there are questions about what do you need um, and, and what don't you need. Um, I want to sort of frame this slightly differently. Uh, and with endings, I think it's a question of who. So who uses it? Who builds it? Who maintains it? Who archives it? Who benefits? And who doesn't? Uh, and then to think as well about who sustains it, and then who sustains it, but in the second sense, who is sustaining that injury? Uh, and then who is sustained by it? Thank you. So we can take questions from the in-person audience, and I will also be moderating our online discussion. Uh, so if you're in the room, just feel free to raise your hand uh, and shout out, and I will be checking you too. Yeah. Yeah, okay, go for it. All right, so forgive me if you answered this in the beginning of the talk, but is the maintenance or the archive of the project or any DH project, is it the goal of the archive to be accessible online or requiring an internet connection? I would, for the endings project, I think the goal is that it would be in an archive such that it can be viewed like any other digital artifact. So the same way that you can view a facsimile of a, of a scan or whatever, um, the idea that you can give it to a library, that's the goal, that you can give it to a library and then somebody can go to the website and it's just there. Maybe there's a DOI and it redirects over to that, to that thing and you can actually use a website um, as, it, as it was originally kind of meant to be used. So not just, you know, on a storage device somewhere. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and I mean that would be, I mean right now that is totally possible, right? You can take, if you have a static website, you can make it into a zip file and give it sort a million different ways on, on various archives, whatever. Um, the act of actually being able to use it uh, and, and reuse it is what we're still sort of bumping up against the challenge, which is the promise, of course, of the Wayback Machine. Um, but as we saw, the Wayback Machine kind of struggles to do some of that archiving. Um, and there are things like search, which are really hard to do in, um, in like a web archive, because search almost always requires um, a, a server um, part of the endings project, which I didn't touch on here, is that Martin Holmes and I have created a sort of static um, search engine called Static Search uh, that runs on um, a set of static HTML files and creates um, what I would say is a fairly robust search engine um, for working um, working o over across a large digital collection. Um, that we're sort of still experimenting with seeing how that would be able to integrate into like a static copy into in the Internet Archive or in a, like a work file. Um, there's no reason why it shouldn't. It's just a limited JavaScript that's required by static searches. Sort of, you can kind of get a little bit messed up in the, in the, 
and how the way back we can handle that. Uh, I just wanted to pick up kind of where you ended with this discussion of the sort of social relations that are inherent in doing this kind of computing and feeling the tension with a lot of the endings principles, which is which are very focused on the artifact. Right, if you if it if the artifact can have these qualities or be built this way, it'll kind of be less sharp, it'll hurt less to sustain it. Um, and that investment of that energy in the artifact seems to suggest a particular kind of social relation is the only one possible, like trying to reduce the burden mm -hmm. to make something maintainable. And yet the idea of like the social relations that we might have around a project, which I think you illustrated with the case studies, are richer and more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you can maybe speak a little bit more to that tension between the principles that endings came up with and this idea of, of relations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think my sort of main, I think, thinking here was that we, that maintenance burden is frequently sort of like relegated as this rote task, and that is why uh, part of the, the, and that is why we did the ending project is to get rid of that burden, um, but that the very act of doing that work is um, reshapes the kind of labor structures and social relations that we sort of um, that are kind of or that are concretized in these in these structures of our, our uh, assumptions of how uh, digital projects are made. That so the faculty member, maybe a developer, um, or a, or a team of developers, research assistants, and they invest all their intellectual energy into it. Then it's done, and then somebody maintains it quietly. In a in a back office somewhere, um, and and no one's wiser until the person in the back office you know, sort of says, "No, I don't want to do this anymore." And then there's sort of a there's a tension, right? Um, and I think what the endings project is trying to alleviate is that tension, but also it's um, sort of uh, amplifying that doing the work of sustaining something and of archiving it and of creating an archivable thing is worthwhile, that maintenance maybe is construed in that in the sort of normative sense is a burden, but we don't need it to be a burden, that we can really rethink the sort of structures that, um, that, that sort of right now support these, these systems. I don't know if that answers your question or if that... Yeah, more things to think uh, thank you, Jeffrey. This is really wonderful. Uh, my question might just be sort of outside the scope, uh, so feel free to be like, that's outside the scope. Um, given that the focus of the Endings Project and your work that you were sharing with us today are specifically on digital humanities projects that take the form, typically, of websites. And I've been thinking a lot over the past, like, you know, six to 12 months as I would watch Twitter, X, whatever we're calling it these days, Decay, and the sort of the web that we grew accustomed to over the past 10 to 20 years fragment in different ways. The de-emphasis of the website as mm -hmm. a unit of internet content and a unit of sort of web experience, right, uh, in favor of things like the post or the video, there's the walled garden problem of various social media platforms, et cetera, so on and so forth. And so I guess I'm, I'm wondering, you know, what thought the y'all the endings projects have sort of put behind the the challenges of all of the other kinds of web content that aren't websites right mm -hmm. um if that is something that we like that we can even do anything about given how their you know po social media posts and other kinds of platform hosted content that are not strictly speaking websites as such are sort of outside of our control uh, as academics, as developers, as designers, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm, I'm seeing, I'm, I'm noticing a kind of paradigm shift in the internet away from websites and towards something else. It's a big old mess. Mm -hmm. And I'm just kind of wondering what thinking we might be able to sort of produce around that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the, I know that there have been, um, there was, uh, I think in, at some point, there's a DHSI course that we that we that I sort of uh, 
joined a little bit of, in the teaching of um, about the how to end a digital project. And I remember that one of the projects there was a Twitter scraping one. This is back in the day of it being Twitter, back when you can actually scrape it right. like uh, easily. Um, another challenge. Yeah. And that uh, and that was a sort of an interesting challenge I remember us working through because there's some this kind of a constant feed of things, right? Um, but I think what you sort of identified is this sort of in endings, it's really about sort of n like really taking control of those digital artifacts and really kind of taking, uh, removing dependencies. And I would say that sort of the post and the rest of these sort of um, uh, genres of, of sort of digital content are kind of about offloading dependency. No one hosts their own website, mm -hmm. everybody has posts, right? And those are all controlled outside, right? So I think the sort of endings um, sort of philosophy for that would be how do you take them and make them your own? How, how can you, right? And sometimes you just, I, I, um, I'm not super familiar with the terms of like licensing, but I wouldn't doubt um, or be afraid that would, that the content that you post there you might not be able to actually get out and, and reasonably own. Um, uh, and I think that would be a, a sort of fundamental sort of um, uh, sort of conflict between the endings principles and what and what that kind of genre of the web is. I mean, it seems to also speak to Trevor's question about the uh, tension between sort of techniques and culture in various ways. That and I'm just kind of riffing here for a moment, uh, but. One of the many impetuses behind the drive of the digital humanities to produce various kinds of web-based projects was accessibility, right? Mm -hmm. Was to get the projects out there for wider and broader audiences. And now, oh, and, and there's a kind of way that the technologies of HTML and CSS and to a lesser extent JavaScript comport well with existing scholarly principles around archiving, preservation, access, all those kinds of things. But now we seem to be running into a brick wall of the culture shifting away from all of those technologies. This isn't something I'm like, and please solve this for us, Joey, because obviously you can't, right? Um, but it, it, you know, it's, it's one that I hadn't really thought about in this way before until your talk kind of helped me thematize it. That I wonder if there's also kind of, speaking to Trevor's question before, almost a way that we have to ensure that folks on the DH side, on the sort of like project building side, who aren't as in tune with all of the labor that goes into preserving and sustaining projects, understand what kinds of technical choices, even if they might rapidly be becoming old fashioned ones, uh, like building a website, uh, which is a distinctly old fashioned kind of thing to do in 2024, are nevertheless necessary if we're going to make sure that knowledge stays accessible simultaneously then making sure that tenure review boards know not to look at a website as an old-fashioned thing mm -hmm. uh, might also be part of it. Anyway, like I said, just riffing, um, but a lot to think about, which I appreciate. Thank you. Can I add just to continue the conversation? I think ultimately it's about scholarly communication, right? right? And uh, scholarly communication, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, still happens through articles and books. Right. And that is not going away. Uh, and we hope. <laughs> <laughs> the articles uh, and books anymore. And, and I agree with you that like the website has become something that was molded on the same idea of like you know that unit of the article and blah blah blah. blah. Uh, but it also because it works with the kind of things that we as scholars tend to want to communicate. Uh, and so I wonder, it, 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 and I also want to acknowledge the shift that you've identified in terms of like. Um, how culture online is being expressed and formed, but at the same time, you know, how uh, do we as scholars, the things that we want to like uh, put out there, how do we make those work with those forms of communication? And I'm not sure that there is always going to be a path that is not going to bring us back to something that is a little bit more tabular, that, that you need to either sort of page through or click through and scroll through. Like, until I see like an entirely new way of interfacing with actual content or the kinds of contents through our small screens, I very much doubt that there is a, a way of making something like, you know, that the, 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 the archives that the judge used as, a, as case studies easily explorable through something that it doesn't work like a website. 
and I think you know even if it's like an app or something that sort of br is brought is accessed through something that is not necessarily a website it's still going to use the, the, those technologies at least for now I think and, and you know so as as the ones who, who are putting out these sort of scholarly communication products yeah that's where we sort of have to make a choice about like you know how much we want to engage with you know companies that are going to determine how we do this in relation to you know the audience that we can access versus doing it in a way that we know it's going to be able to be preserved long term because we understand the technology that allows us to do that. And yeah, yeah it's like there's no. I'm also like I don't know where <laughs> this is going, but like it's it's difficult to to, to see the future in, in, in that and and how and anything that you know thinking about where it's going to go and who's going to do it is is a great way of thinking about scholarly communications in the age. The NX projects, I think, is a little strict <laughs> in the way that mm -hmm. it doesn't think, but it, it offers a, an outlook. Yeah, and, and one of the things I didn't get to say about the NX project um, is that, uh, uh, this is, um, I mean, the NX project was always predicated on the, or built on the notion that we had projects that were existing in a particular way and we needed to satisfy them. Um, and this is the way that I think it's actually most feasible for a lot of people to do it. Uh, to do the work of endings is that sometimes you need to make the negotiation of, yeah, I'm, this is a database. It needs to be a database. That's just easier. Let's make it a database. And then you make, then you have to do the work of making a static version of that database. And that can be interesting. That's, right now, that's a main sort of component of my job at the Digital Humanities Innovation Lab, is thinking about all of these database-backed projects that we have um, and how to make them static. Um, one example that I didn't get to talk about um, today is a, a, a poetry journal um, called Fragmenting the West Coast um, uh, by uh, Rina Garcia Chua uh, at SFU slash UBC. And that was a journal that was receiving um, incoming uh, uh, poetry submissions that was managed through open journal systems. Uh, and we use the Open Journal Systems API and a combination of GitHub to download static copies of the, Git, of the OJS API and then create a static map from that. Uh, and so that was a sort of interaction between, well, we could have created some data format. This could have been a, a, a like an 11T website or something like that where we get a data structure, but doing it in OJS is had affordances that made sense, and it, but we had to kind of infrastructurally work around that. Um, and then we're doing that with older projects too, so projects that are kind of dormant, um, figuring out how to get a static version out of them, which is interesting and you know, raises all sorts of questions about the data model, about remodeling data. Um, Actually, that kind of segues into a question that I've been thinking about um, across your talk, which has been really awesome. Thank you so much for uh, giving us this awesome presentation. Um, because you mentioned uh, talking to developers about the endings principles, um, getting to the last principle where you're saying no dependencies, and this is often the sticking point. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm often, and I am one of those developers who's like, oh my god, how would I ever do anything about JavaScript? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, so I'm kind of curious, um, you know, if you could take a little bit of time to talk through one of those moments you were just talking about, where you have a site that has all of these, you know, fancy bells and whistles, things going off the page, zooming around, doing all the stuff, and mm -hmm. then you're trying to convert it to a static site. Like, what does it? You know, what has your experience been with taking something that's really sort of JavaScript heavy and um, translating it into something that is less um, so? And how might, and is there a way that you might answer that question with an eye toward tips for developers um, trying to think about implementing these principles? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think um, the, the dependency thing is, is the most sort of, uh, like it has caveats, right? Like it has, uh, in the uh, principles themselves, really, which uh, I think it was right here. Um, in the products, there's the no dependency. You can see sort of 4.1, 4.3. Oh uh, no, Bootstrap is my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but then there's products like Star, right? Except uh, once a fully working static site is achieved, it may be enhanced by the use of other services. Um, the use of an external library may be necessary to support a specific function that's too complex to be coded locally. Um, so 
there's sort of uh, a recognition that sometimes things like mapping, you're not going to rewrite mapping code. That's just too hard. However, you can you you have to be sort of diligent in your use of which mapping code do you use. Do you use mm -hmm. Leaflet or Open Layers or some other random one that you have no idea how it's how it works? You don't know what it depends on, um, and so that's sort of the the rationale. Things like Bootstrap is a, is a, and this was written before Bootstrap five, so this is thinking about Bootstrap four, um, which is jQuery, and it's like well, Bootstrap comes with this necessary JavaScript which also comes with necessary jQuery. That's two levels of dependency, and it's not really necessary. The stuff that you're doing, in, like that Bootstrap does for you automatically, like open and close the menu nav things, are fairly easy to like implement, but. Sorry, before I jump in, was that, did you want to like respond back? Oh no, I'm, or, yeah. I'm just, um, so, that is a sticking point for me too, a little bit from a technical perspective because like the term dependency, especially an external dependency, makes me feel of it that it needs to be gone and reached over there. And I understand that for line maps because if you're using a service like Google Maps, then you're accessing a service and the service changes and goes away and all of that. But a lot of these tools, especially the open source ones, when you build static websites, they get baked into your code. Mm -hmm. So there are no longer external dependencies that could disappear. The license that, that, that you are using that code that you baked in will remain available for that code at mm -hmm. that time. So, uh, you know, obviously, if you need to then update your site, etc., then you run into the prob the problem of you know maintaining the code and you identify mm -hmm. that that's two different stages. So I don't necessarily sort of see the problem with like jQuery uh, as long as you know it's baked in there and, and we know that it, it currently works with. Uh, with browsers and to complicate it, you know, with like if, I, if I'm using Bootstrap and then I build my static website where everything is baked in and I'm not going to get assets from somewhere else, then why is that problematic? Yeah, well, there's sort of two replies. And then I think my personal feeling about that is that when you have dev dependencies or something, those almost have more into processing. That would be my kind of feeling, is that because when you pack them up and web pack them or whatever, they kind of become part of the processing dependency in a sense, which are allowed. That is how I justify it to myself. Um, I don't think some of my collaborators at Ending would necessarily agree, um, but I also think that there, there's also sort of the, the principle of the thing. I think the idea of including jQuery when you really don't need that much bloat is part of the is part of the sort of impetus here. Is that only kind of taking what you need uh, and really thinking about do you actually need that and all of the stuff like you need all of Lodash? Do you need all of the stuff that comes with Lodash and all the way down? Right. So I think it's about being. It's also trying to kind of foster a very intentional practice. Yeah. Um, I think other people in endings would say no. <laughs> don't use, don't use them. Just do it like just you know. But I think it, I think it kind of depends on how you interpret said that sort of hermeneutics of reading or a, yeah. I think you're already answering this in, in a way. But are, are we saying that it's a sustainability issue that like uh, archiving even hardware and software or, or iterative versions of software that can run those dependencies is just not sustainable or, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, yeah, I think we don't know, the, the, I think the main thing, uh, this, it kind of leads back to this sort of notion of we don't know what's out there, how is other servers, don't trust anybody else, mm -hmm. is sort of part of that, of the ending principles. Um, and it's sort of, we don't know all of what's going on in Lodash, or we don't know what's all is going on in these like larger libraries. Uh, why take all of this stuff in if we don't know how it kind of functions um, or what is being sort of included? Um, and I think in terms of the sort of question of like broader software, broad, broader hardware, um, I think that kind of goes back to that conversation with scholar communication um, that we were having earlier, uh, just insofar as um, I'm thinking of the um, digits report uh, from a couple years ago. Um, where they talk about uh, Docker as a new uh, sort of uh, uh, a new form and container of 
of, of scholarly communications, where containerized environments may be a, a solution to some of this, mm -hmm. some of these problems, especially of things like really these sort of um, not yet imagined forms of scholarly uh, communication that may may be really sort of predicated on software. Um, so I think that is kind of an approach, and it's it's sort of it feels endings e to me. Like the idea of using a Docker container, which is self-contained, feels and like it just sort of feels like, like I have no real justification for it. It just seems like it has the right. As long as it's somewhat self-sufficient, then yeah, 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 yeah. I did. Oh, sorry. No. I did have the idea of like, is there a platform needed to it, in this? But I mean, you have the uh, archive.org, you have the Wayback Machine, but like mm -hmm. a platform needed, and I guess in that sense that that fits kind of what that thought is that you know having uh, some it's specifically for uh, archiving or preservation in that sense. Yeah, we know yeah. that like that everything can fit into that one thing. I mean, hopefully, I guess in some ways that's idealistic because uh, compatibility, you know, <laughs> even with like Macs or Windows or, you know, things like that. But yeah, I, listening to what you're saying, I, I'm, in my own head, I'm thinking about how do we hold on to all of it in ways that, um, but because I don't, Personally, I don't want everything to always live on the internet. Accessibility, uh, uh, you know, is important. I feel like, but I, you know, I just, uh, I guess, in some ways, I like the thought of the personal physical object that I have that I hold on to. It's mine, <laughs> not everyone's. Um, but uh, so. You know, that I, I'm just thinking about well, well, how do we hold on to that so that you can? It's always usable uh, in the mm -hmm. form, like you said, structurally. It's the, mm -hmm. the you know holding to the, the same structures. Uh, yeah, I, I I'm not sure how that looks like, but mm -hmm. I, I I like that idea uh, of the container. Yeah. Yeah, and I and I will say things like the any project the sort of um, in the article um, in the HQ we talk about. So the next step being how do libraries accession these these mm -hmm. objects basically? Mm -hmm. uh, how do they take them and bring them into the catalog? And that's a really good question. Um, things like URLs, really interesting. How do you, how, libraries aren't going to hold on to URLs? <laughs> They're not going to pay for URLs and domain names forever. Mm -hmm. um, then they shouldn't have to, right? That's uh, completely um, difficult, especially if you have a custom URL, right? That's not going to that's not going to fly for a library. So. Figuring out strategies for that URL remapping, is that minting DOIs, is that minting URNs, like what, what does that look like? Um, and then also um, how, how to make sure that they're displayable. Some um, archive software like DSpace, I believe, will uh, display uh, like a HTML folder and serve it, um, but not a lot of other archive technologies do. I, and then don't quote me on DSpace. I think it does, but I'm not, but I'm not positive. OK, awesome. Do we have any more questions from you? In that case, we can close here. Thank you so much, Joey, yeah, for this awesome you. presentation. <laughs> and thank you, audience, uh, for your awesome participation. Thanks for joining us. Uh, and please join us again in two weeks for our next Digital Dialogues event, uh, which will be a round table hosted by the Keywords of Black, Keywords for Black Louisiana Project uh, from Johns Hopkins University. Uh, so we'll be back in two weeks. Join us then. <laughs>